Hello everybody and welcome to the Artist Works Live Dispatch from Home. I am Patricia Butler and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Artist Works. For those of you who don't know who we are, we are an online music education company uh, and we work with 36 world-renowned musicians and virtuosi who teach online at Artist Works using what's kind of an interesting and, and different and new way to learn online we call video exchange. So we've been doing these live dispatches really since the beginning of the whole pandemic. And um, so we've been coming on, you know, once or twice a week with a couple of our uh, musicians that teach at Artist Works. At Artist Works. And I'm very happy tonight uh, to have with me both Jason Vio on classical guitar uh, and Dave Bilger is joining us as well. Uh, and he is principal trumpet of the Philadelphia Orchestra. He's got a sleeping baby, so he's not able to play tonight, but he is joining us. And uh, we try to start every single live stream with a musical tribute to those who are on the front lines, perhaps in this pandemic, or uh, just maybe struggling a little bit in their life. And we want to bring a bit of a musical oasis to you. So this evening, Jason is going to start us off with that um, musical beginning. And so I give to you Jason Vio. Thanks, Patricia. Hello here from Lakewood, Ohio, and uh, I'd like to just start with a piece by Andres Segovia, uh, one of the most important guitarists uh, maybe in history, uh, the Spanish guitarist. And he wrote this piece actually while he was recovering from eye surgery. Uh, he couldn't see for a little while when he was recovering in the hospital. And so he wrote this uh, piece called Estudio Sin Luz, which means uh, study without light.
Thank you. That was beautiful, and I <laughs> wow. <laughs> Perfect way to start. Perfect way for us to start this evening. Tell us a little bit about the piece you just played. I mean, I know that Segovia wrote it when he couldn't yeah. see. Is that correct? That's correct. Not a lot wow. of people. Uh, not a lot of people know that Segovia even wrote any pieces, and he didn't I write didn't. very many. Uh, he wrote maybe three or four. Uh, and like a handful of short pieces and a couple of them are studies and I think a, you know a couple of them. I don't really know the other ones this the reason I know this piece is because I studied it when I was 12 years old it's one of the oh first concert pieces I ever played and it was really difficult for me actually when I was 12 <laughs> <laughs> especially, especially yeah, that cool. middle section yeah um, but um, yeah, I've been bringing it. I, I recorded it for um, my uh, 2014 uh, album Play, which won a Grammy in 2015. Yeah. And uh, I, I, that was the first time I had brought the piece back since I was a kid. And uh, yeah. so this COVID, I guess during this period, it, it kind of sort of floated into my, you know, my consciousness, I guess, yeah. again. And we had a, I had a, a concert June 6th with Colin Davin the other uh, you yeah. know, co uh, classical guitar instructor from my school. And we did that live stream in Cleveland, and uh, that was in the program. So it's been fun wow. just kind of bringing oh, nice. that piece back. Nice. Well, we are also joined by uh, Dave Bilger. As I mentioned, he's the principal trumpeter uh, with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And these two guys have several things in common, um, not the least of which is a young family. Uh, but uh, they also both are uh, online faculty at Artist Works, but they also both teach at the famed Curtis Institute. So, like, I know you guys aren't seeing each other in the halls anymore, but do you normally <laughs> run, do you run into each other at Curtis? We do, yeah. Um, I'm always a little worried because sometimes I have the room next to Jason's when I'm teaching, <laughs> and you know, I, I mean, <laughs> um, the the rooms are fairly soundproof, but you know, I didn't. Want, I'm always concerned that the trumpets are going to blast through the walls. <laughs> do we bother you? No, I mean at those uh, the facilities are very good, and uh, it's uh, one of the many reasons it's such a pleasure to teach there we don't you know it's the, the soundproofing i think of those play, those studios are really great oh that's good to know <laughs> <laughs> so what what is changing now for curtis i mean this is a heralded institution that is steeped in a long long tradition of in-person one-to-one master to student instruction what's uh, what's happening at curtis well, we're we're going online, totally online for Are the for, for the fall semester, right? Right, Dave. I mean, that's my yeah, understanding. Yeah, the, the entire fall semester is going to be online. I mean, the school itself is. Um, we have this brand new uh, building that went up, um, you know, seven, eight years ago. Eight years um, ago. Yeah. Yeah. Eight years ago, and um, it's um, it doubled the the size and capacity of the school, but. It's still small hallways and small practice rooms and small spaces because there's only 150 students. So there's really no way to, to stay distanced in that, in that facility. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they do value us. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's faculty that are much more ancient than we are. <laughs> and um, they don't want to expose the faculty as well as the students. So um, they made the decision to, to go online. Um, you know, I was dubious about it. I mean, obviously, I believe in online education because I've been with Artist Works for many years. Right. But um, but there was a question of whether the synchronous learning versus the asynchronous stuff that is the the trademark of Artist Works um, would be so successful. And there were some definitely some some moments there. You know, there was a learning curve to it, um, without a doubt. Uh, we we use I use Zoom. I don't know, Jason, That's what, what you I'm use. That's what I was just gonna ask. What what's everybody using? Are you guys mostly just going to one on one with Zoom? Uh, mostly Zoom. I would say. I mean, in the case of Curtis, uh, for our students, we had um, the 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 seminar class would be on Zoom. But the the four students, we have a very you know selective studio of four students they preferred to actually send in complete performances of the pieces they were working on and then we would send written comments back but that that works well i, I mean i think i don't know that that works well for most students in that sense but 
the pros of that, it, it was very similar to kind of artist works actually, where they send in a full performance and then we watch the video a couple times, make comments and this kind of thing, or, or then we would have a Zoom meeting, you know, to kind of go, I would have a Zoom meeting in addition to the emailing them the comments and then kind of demonstrating things or having them play things again to, to sort of reiterate, okay, uh, this is what I meant, you know, on measure 38 and whatnot. Uh, at Cleveland Institute of Music, uh, those were all Zoom, just live uh, Zoom lessons and the seminar classes there. Uh, uh, there. We are actually going to be in uh, the building uh, this fall at oh, Cleveland really? Institute of Music. Yeah. At Cleveland, you're going to be in the building. Yeah. At, and Northwestern is also going to be in, in the buildings where, where I also work. Um, the transition at Curtis was um, sort of manageable because, um, you know, we had, we had to, to, it took a few weeks for folks to get set up, um, to get decent mics, to understand that it, it, there's a value to hooking into Ethernet instead of Wi-Fi. And, right. and to be honest, the Zoom software caught up a little bit as well. They issued some updates, which really helped. It's still not optimal for music, um, but it's better and it's really, it's workable. Um, and we did our studio class that way as well, which was an attempt to try to keep community. Because what, what do we do as musicians? We're, we relate to one another. And so just living in a, a basement and practicing, <laughs> while it can be good for your technique, yeah. really doesn't help you as a, as a, as a, a musician. No, um, no, and, and so working through that with the whole idea of, of creating community helped. At Northwestern, with a much larger group, we had five at Curtis, and we had 15 that term at, um, at Northwestern. Um, we usually have a few more, but we had a few, a couple of people who, who took the term off. Um, we, you know, that was a little more challenging in the big group stuff. And we did have to change how we function because most, most of the studio class was performance based. And we ended up doing a mix of performance and prepared, um, you know, presentations of pieces or discussions and compare and contrast works of a, s a certain genre. I mean, it took stuff that like, politically activist works from like the 1950s and 60s oh and compared some of those some eastern european things i mean just some stuff that we wouldn't have done and it actually yeah. was pretty fascinating well, i learned yeah, i learned things about pieces because it was like oh my gosh i got to come up with something that's a little bit different right yeah um so those adjustments i think i'm going to keep some of the ideas that i've worked on and had to develop through the distance learning and add it to back when we when we are live yeah. um you know yeah do you think yes. having an online curriculum for your students would be helpful to them? Is there any reason why it wouldn't be? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I would say that, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's definitely going to be a, 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 as a result of all this, people are going to see these, these new outcomes that they either, you know, didn't see before, or they just wouldn't have had the time to do. I mean, I'm definitely going to, you know, consider these new developments or these new ways of teaching uh, online. Of course, I already have been, having done that with artist works as well for eight years now. Um, but yeah, I think that's definitely going to change. I think it'll, it'll definitely change the way. It's kind of like what, they, with what they're talking about with sports, even the things they're yeah. finding out in the major American sports, that, that, that this will leave its kind of mark on that. Uh, in terms of how teams train and and and, uh, and, and that kind of thing too. So. Yeah. Well, I, folks have asked. Uh, go ahead, oh, Dave. Folks have asked um, about like what what's the impact going to be on the arts community? You know, the the pandemic because you know the worry is of course that major institutions are going to falter because of this. And what I always answer is that those who are able to adapt, those who learn and um, are malleable and figure out how to change what they do and adapt it to different situations are going to thrive and those who behave like dinosaurs and don't evolve are going to go the way of the dinosaurs and right. those are the institutions that are going to be in trouble those who are re those institutions and people who are reactive and learn and adapt are the ones that are going to thrive especially post pandemic yeah and i think that there's an issue of competition as well in at like just very much like what you're saying those people who don't adapt are going to find themselves on the outside and there's always an entrepreneur somewhere trying to find a better solution that kind of breaks the old paradigm so 
I, I doubt seriously anything's going to happen to Curtis because it's such an esteemed institution. But I think there are a lot of universities that just somehow, for some reason, still see online education as inferior. Um, well, Curtis was uh, already working on um, on out on establishing a, a sort of a, a robust online presence, mostly to reach out to underserved communities um, and and provide free training to folks who. Um, can't honestly af afford lessons. Um, and so they were trying to get a repository of, um, of things. Jonathan Biss did an, an amazing set of, uh, well, it was Beethoven, right? He, taught, yeah. he did five five or six two hour things on Beethoven. And, and Coursera. They ended up find, yeah, yeah. Uh, over Coursera. And so they ended up finding a lot of folks who simply were interested. <laughs> and secondly, folks who, who wanted to learn uh, who were players. Uh, so it, it worked in a you know, in a way, and, and I, I assume that over time that they'll be adding adding to these kinds of of um, kinds of, of offerings. Yeah, and uh, Cleveland Institute as well was uh, I think way ahead of the curve of this thing. And the first time I ever heard of like Internet Two was I think like two thousand eight, two thousand nine. I was doing distance learning uh, distance learning lessons at the CIM studios to interlock him. You know, and that kind of thing. So there were definitely, there were some definitely brick and mortar schools that were, I think, kind of already had some of the this technology or the or the idea of it in place. The the difficulty is the the synchronous portion of what we do. I mean, relating in real time to another musician, and that's that's you know ensemble playing, uh, and that's something that is uh, at present not something that we can successfully do over the web. So we produce musician in a box videos, right? Which, what? you know, uh, I mean, like you know, there were some, there were, there were some cool things that were put up, um, but then there was a lot of stuff on social that was like so a little good. cringeworthy, um, yeah. both in production value and also in, in uh, you cheese know, some factor. performance, uh, cheese factor, exactly. <laughs> um, but then as the, as the pandemic went, you, you end up seeing, oh my gosh, you know the production value is going on, and in fact, yeah. in Philadelphia Orchestra, we referred to, referred to um, we went uh, as our CEO said um, from one night to the next morning, we changed from being a concert organization to a media company. Right. Wow. And um, we started producing a lot of musician in a box videos, and wow. uh, as well as uh, putting up archival stuff. But then we had to reinvent that, and we called it Virtual Philadelphia Orchestra 2.0. Um, yeah, where we had to change and update and upgrade and yeah. have it actually visually look like something and and in, improve our our production skills and that's something that I think is going to be a, a huge carryover into the future for the generation that's studying now is to understand how to employ that technology and use it in a, a classical music setting yeah. you know yeah. It's a positive and perhaps permanent change, and maybe it's needed in the world of classical music anyway, because there's, you know, some mindset of people that uh, don't necessarily embrace classical music, but if they can find it online more frequently, there might be more wider acceptance of it. Um, you know, there's just a, a, it's a, it may be a permanent trend. So we, uh, I'm happy to see that the orchestras are, are starting to think more digitally um, much like uh, the Metropolitan Opera did, where they started with their, what, are they the matinees or, or some? I, well, we've gone to a couple of the Metropolitan mm -hmm. Opera sure. per, oh, uh, yeah. performances. That's, uh, I, you know, I'm not going to go to the Met in New York right now, but I am going to go to the local theater when I can sit six feet apart from somebody and pay to go watch <laughs> that. So maybe there's some new solutions here. You know? Yeah, the problem is is monetizing it, and that's, that's what um, arts institutions are, are are up against. Because most people look at the web and they want free content. I mean, we're so used to having free content, right? Yes. Um, and putting things behind paywalls and getting used to getting super high quality things, but having to pay a couple of bucks for it is 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 yeah. the jump. And yeah. I think I'm hoping that we're going to see that. I mean, obviously Berlin has a digital concert hall, which is truly awesome um which is on your computer not in your in your local movie theater but it's 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 stunning and you know i i, I go there and i listen and i watch and yeah. it's it's great um and it's subscription based but without their amount of government support they wouldn't be able to do it they're not yeah. making money off of it they're it's 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 part of their brand 
but it's it's not really a way to to pay pay the musicians and right. and for arts institutions in America that don't have that level of government support it's a, it's a challenge so the challenge is to think outside the box and figure out how to monetize it so that it's still democratized and everybody can afford it but to bring in enough to at least make some dent in in you know the the expenses of these institutions yeah for sure and Jason you're, we're used to you doing a lot of solo performances. Tell us what's happening with your career. What's what's happening? What's not happening? Well, I mean, we uh, that live stream one was a good experiment. I'm I'm a little bit more, you know, I'm a little bit ambivalent about not about do, you know. I, I still I'm very much a live player in the sense that of people sure. in in the room and the energy in the in the hall and the room and all that. Thing summer best I think on June sixth and uh, uh, and I've got some little concert with cellist Imbal Segev and that's a private that's going to be at a, a a private house in Connecticut and very safe like twenty people in feet and uh, masks and everybody has to wear masks and things so. So I'm doing that, and then I have uh, something for Cleveland Institute of Music, which is kind of like a donor event. That's a private event. That's on August 10th. And then uh, this concert that was canceled in Los Angeles at the end of uh, June, uh, we're going to try to do that from my house. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, or, lots or some location in Cleveland. Um, so they're trying to get you scheduled out, then that's good. They're trying to, you know, replace the concerts that you're not able to perform, it sounds like, and one from your home. I mean, that's Lots of luck, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, um, we have a few folks that wanted to say hello. Uh, if, it's, if it's okay. Um, uh, I, the kids will have sorry, to be, Jason. be in Go the, ahead. somewhere else. But... I'm sorry if I interrupted you, Jason. Yeah, well, basically, like, like the, oh, no, no, it's okay. No, no worries. I was just going to say that the kids, when you do something like that, the kids <laughs> and will just, you know, in the, in the bank. Well, um, anyway, yeah, we should take some time. Okay. I don't know. Is it me or is it Jason? But it, no, it's it, it's uh, he's uh, he's proving why he he's mostly a live player. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just wasn't sure if I was still live or not. Uh, but Jason, uh, you're you're live and you're, and you're clear. Okay. But but Jason's a little glitchy right now. Okay, so you can so. see my slightly panicked face from time to time then, because <laughs> I'm like, what's happening here? <laughs> okay, oh. Jason, you, uh, <laughs> does that explain a few things, Jason? Oh, uh, I, I guess so, but it doesn't show on my end. It's I, I see all three of us on okay, the screen. Okay, good. So. I'm glad yeah. you can see us. We, but you were coming in and out. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not your fault. It's the internet. Blame the internets. <laughs> um, so a couple folks wanted to say hello. Um, and Susan is one of our students that is on several uh, websites or several of our courses, and I'm always happy to see you, Susan. Thanks for joining us. Um, and then uh, she's from East Lansing, uh, Michigan, and then Martin is from West Haven, Connecticut. Thank you for joining us, Martin. It's nice to have you here. Um, and Daniel is from Folsom, California, not all that far away from here. Um, and then here's a guy you might know. Let's see, where did he go? Oh, I lost him already. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but we do have, um, let's see, I, I have seen this name on here before, but I'm not sure where he's from. Um, but anyway, he wanted to I say know, hello. I know Dan, Daniel. <laughs> he wanted to say hello. And then here's John Graves. He wanted to say hello to both of you. <laughs> hey, John. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, John Graves is the vice president of Artist Works, and he's worked with both of these great musicians when they were Reza. in the studio. That might be Reza. 
Oh, I don't know. Um, so let's see, Jason, I'd love to try to have you play. I'm a little bit worried about your connection though. Um, yeah, that's, that was, uh, was the connection okay in the first piece? It was beautiful. I yeah, mean, the performance was, just, was ridiculously great. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I was just here going like, wow. <laughs> no, it was awe-inspiring. Um, but we might need you to try again to come oh, in, Jason. <laughs> You might need to leave the studio and come back. Yeah, if it, that might that might work. It often does. You want to try oh. leave leave the studio Let's and come try back. That. Okay. All right. I'll leave so, the studio. And I'll bring you right back in as soon as you come on. <laughs> and come back. Yes. Okay. All right. So it's me and you, Dave. Great. Here we are. <laughs> yeah. Um, for those of you who are listening, you can hear some pretty loud white noise, and Jason's been having trouble with the computer that he's using, but we would love to get him back on the stream here so that he can play another musical piece for you. Um, while we're waiting on that, I, I had a question from uh, John Mathis, and so this is for you, Dave. He'd like to know if you buzz. I would imagine that's the exercise. Well, that look at my hair. Well, then there's that. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I mean, what what he's uh, what he's talking about is is his mouthpiece as part of uh, the warm up and the practice every day, and um, yes, I do. I mean, there's a there's a there are two camps in in trumpet uh, pedagogy. It's like, do you buzz or not? Um, and so what I always say is, uh, you know, I, I teach my students how to do it, and if it works for them, then that's terrific. And if it doesn't, then they can just throw it away and you know, and not, not do it. But not for me, it's it. just playing. Just gives me, you know, some. It, it's this most basic tone production comes from, from just buzzing in the mouthpiece. And so I do, I do that to start the day each day. I do some um, little scalar stuff and some some bends. Um, and actually, in uh, the Artist Works course, um, we do have a, a couple of chapters on on buzzing. And then do you question. do do any exercises or warm ups just with your lips without the mouthpiece? Some do and I I'm not someone who does that. Um but I know some other really fine players who do. It's like I said about the the mouthpiece buzzing if it if it if it's a benefit for you then use it. Um and with the with the lip buzzing I haven't really found a great benefit to doing it so I don't do it. But I I do know players who who enjoy doing it and and it it helps them to sort of get the uh, get things going in, especially in the mornings i will do it occasionally in the car um when I, yes. but i usually keep a mouthpiece in the car as well so i can buzz in on the way to work <laughs> yes i can remember just driving to restaurants with you when you were at, at oh, Napa no, telling recording. stories yeah well i mean it was no big deal but uh, uh, bill caballero did the same thing you guys both had your mouthpieces in the morning you know and so you're yeah just getting a jump jump start on the day right yeah right. but lip buzzing just the yeah. i mean you know yeah flute feels okay do i don't know i just yeah Thank goodness, right? Because <laughs> yeah, that would be bad. All right. Well, it looks like we have Jason back. We have another question for you, Dave, but let's see if we can get Jason back on here and maybe okay. play a tune for us. Well, a piece That would be for awesome. Us. All right. Mm -hmm. Hang on one second. There he is. So we're, okay. we're back a little bit better now? We are. Oh, this we is fabulous. Just, let's take advantage of it and have you play something, Jason. Take it away. We'll leave this to Jason Leo. Well, this is an etude, actually, a study I recently wrote uh, over the last couple of weeks. It's called uh, Grumble. Grumble, okay.
Bravo. That was that was beautiful, it's Jason. Beautiful. Just another great performance. I just I really truly want to see you back on the stage. I do. But it's wonderful to have you here for sure. Oh, thanks. Um, I don't think this message or this question is so much for Dave, but certainly for you, Jason. How in the world do you memorize an entire piece like that? Oh. Is it is it measure by measure? How how do you do that? Well, I I work at so many different tempos in the early stages of learning a piece, uh, and even non tempos, like a lot of like isolations of all parts of the piece, or certainly anything that's difficult in it. And I think the the aggregate amount of all the repetitions that I do in practice, the piece actually starts to become memorized on on its own for me. I've never really I never really struggled that much with with memor memorization of a piece. The only time it would be is if I was particularly rushed, you know, mm -hmm. for a particular concert or a particular event or something like that. I didn't get the amount of you know reps time that I that I would normally want to. Um, so that that process, I think I think the thing is I, I think what I've learned over the years, and what a lot of people told me that I do it a lot, an awful lot of repetitions and practice yeah. I think is the thing because I, I don't want to be able to I don't want to have to think while I'm playing I just want to listen that's kind of like that's I want to go so far into that so deep into that that I'm not even really thinking about what I'm doing this was yeah. hard this was really hard actually that's the first time I ever played that for anybody and oh I was, is that right oh yeah no I just wrote I mean I just put the finishing touches on it a week oh, wow. ago or, or so and it's meant to be at a study and I mean, maybe we can, maybe we'll put it on Artist Works or something for the students. It's hard. It's difficult. Yeah. It's more advanced than the other one that I did for Artist Works. Yeah, it's for your advanced students. That's that's good. One of the questions I have really for for both of you is, uh, you know, in classical music, there's some latitude for interpretation of the piece. Um, but how much latitude? And where do you, how do you know? what the correct interpretation is and how do you understand what the composer meant i, I recently read a review uh, a review of something and it's it, it was they they reminded the 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 reader of this quote that that something that wanda ladoska said the the harpsichordist said to pablo casals that you play bach your way and I'll play Bach his way. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so. Okay. So well, it's, but yeah. it's, it's a complex dance. And, and I think it's, yeah. it, in a way, you know, probably Jason has more room because bas playing chamber music and, and solo recitals, um, you know, there's, there's more room for personality. In the orchestra, there's a, like a real sense of performance practice and there's sometimes less you can do rhythmically because you're having to play with a hundred people but what i always do is to try to figure out what that framework is what what is the history of performance practice of the piece what did the composer sort of intend what is that style what is that era and then look for those places and look hard and and spend the time to figure out where you've got room to be personal because there always is room for, to be personal sometimes it's only this much room sometimes it's a <laughs> lot of room right it really depends on on the the nature of it like for orchestral trumpet uh, the ballerina's dance from petrushka is going to be either 112 or 108 <laughs> and there's no rubato and it's like execute right you know you can maybe do a little bit with how you phrase in the middle but but it's really it's pretty it's pretty much set for you but yeah. the post on solo from Mahler third is off stage and the conductor basically follows you and you've got just so much room That's great. so really it depends on what how much room the composer gave you and what you can find in it um yeah. and i think there's not ever right or wrong and there's just there's better and maybe <laughs> stuff that's more challenging and that comes from maybe from doing i don't know maybe 90 or 100 performances of beethoven seven and some of them are just sort of cookie cutter, but then you get yeah. great conductors who come in and they've got like something really different to say, but it still sounds like Beethoven. You yeah. know, it's like, how did you do that? And then you, you study and you think about like, how did they make that happen? Yeah. How can I steal that? How can I steal <laughs> some of that, some of those ideas? It's you know? their interpretation of something so historic that you know, we didn't have a recording, so there's no way to really know. 
exactly how it was meant to be, and we have to interpret the writings on the piece, I guess. Well, right. It's it, you know, it's it's it, you're trying to like it's like reading a foreign language. It's 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 yeah. notes on a page, and somehow you have to bring that to life. Uh, and yeah. I think that what's dif that's what differentiates a lot of of students who are developing really fine technique with artists like Jason who who play and and it's just like all music, right? Yeah. It transcends the technical because the ideas are about the music and the technique supports that. Yeah, that's a good you. answer. Thank you. Well, we. Have, I love um, that. I love that answer. I was surprised, yeah. especially the end part of that answer. The was right. with yes. the, with <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, we do have a question, uh, a couple of questions here. Um, uh, this one is from John Mathis, who joins oh, us wow. frequently. Thank you so much for being here. He is a trumpet player, but um, he is asking you, Jason, Mr. Vio, uh, what's your favorite? Favorite Villanova's oh, etude. Wow, mm, etude. That's a that's a hard that's a tough one. I know because that, that's kind of what I've been doing a lot the last few months yes. is writing a lot of uh, etudes and some sort of concert couple concert pieces. Yeah, I would say that my favorites are really number five. Uh, the uh, Yeah, it's a very Stravinsky, uh, Stravinsky-esque kind of uh, piece. Yeah. And uh, and then also the beautiful. Um... Gotta reach my guitar there. <laughs> there we go. I mean, I don't even really think of this as an etude. I mean, this is just a gorgeous. That's a gorgeous piece. That's number eight. So I think I'd say five and eight for me. Okay. All right. That's it. I'm going to say that's a fair answer because <laughs> it sounded right. It sounded right. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are joining us, um, you can see the crawl here that you can get free sample lessons from both of these great musicians just by going to artistworks.com forward slash free lessons. Um, and then we do have another um, question here. And let me just see. I think John, thank you, John, for these questions. They're great. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and put another uh, John question up there. And he's asking, Dave, do you play natural trumpet or cornetto? And maybe we could talk a little bit about the difference there, Dave. Sure. Uh, the natural trumpet is the Baroque instrument with no valves. And uh, the modern ones uh, have um, holes uh, in them so that you can, that help with intonation and help to lock things in. So some purists use a natural trumpet without these vent holes and others use them with. Um, I have a student who graduated from Curtis uh, two years ago, or no, last year, who was spending this year at the Scola Cantorum in Basel. And so he was taking natural trumpet um, very seriously and I had to do some learning, but I wouldn't play it in public. Um, it's not, not yet my thing. Uh, I do own a cornetto and beside, which is a, a wooden instrument that was wow. wrapped in leather and it's shaped it's curved a little bit and it's recorder fingerings hmm. but it's it's buzzed and back in the day they played it out of the corner of the mouth with this tiny mouthpiece hmm. most players now use a slightly bigger mouthpiece and put it where we like to to buzz a, a regular mouthpiece but um it's uh it was a likened to be most like the human voice uh and there, there's some incredible repertoire from um from uh you know the very you know rena renaissance into baroque that mm -hmm. uses that was written for the cornetto and then it sort of died out because it's a very subtle instrument it's not loud and so once the instruments started getting louder the cornetto sort of fell by the waysides a little bit so mm -hmm. i have played that in public but not well um <laughs> uh, it makes my hands hurt i don't know how woodwind players do it yeah because <laughs> it's like Oh, the big stretches and stuff. Uh, super um, fun to practice and to play on. Um, I used to, in recitals, do a, a Bach um, a chorale, a chorale prelude um, on Nun komm der Heiden Heiland, which hmm. starts with, with just a statement of the chorale, and then it's a, a four-part organ piece, and I would play the top part on a, on a modern piccolo trumpet, but I would play the initial entrance, the, the, the statement of the, of the chorale on a cornetto, and just to give people a sense of what that sounded like. Uh, and the reason I could do that is it was a chorale, it was slow, and I could make my yeah. fingers work. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. 
Well, um, we have a very important question here for you, Jason. Um, I don't know if you know Michael or not, but he would like to know <laughs> if you're glad you gave up football. <laughs> hey, Mike, how's it going? Mike's a high school buddy of mine. Well, I haven't heard from him maybe since high school. It's amazing that he's tuning in. How you doing, Mike? Uh, is that yeah. Right? yeah. Oh my gosh! I, wow. It's it's a little bit of a joke because he pro he probably is referencing the fact that I was a very frustrated, you know, sports fan and and would have loved to have played football and could cat my brother and I would you know play catch. My brother had a really good arm too, and uh, but I like loved you know all kind of sports and I but I stopped playing soccer at around 12 or 13 because yeah. I was afraid I would hurt my I yeah. was really that was kind of a decision that I made on my own that I think it's the right thing to do and it was, it was heartbreaking for me because I you know and uh, but I never and I really stayed away from football because I thought I'm definitely gonna break my fingers playing that sport so yeah you got to stay away from sharp knives too yeah right? I mean, all <laughs> yeah <musicians> too. <laughs> yeah <laughs> No, I'm um, like so when I'm when I've got the bread, especially those bread knives. So those yeah. those can really like do a lot of damage. Like I'm super careful with them. Don't cut a bagel. Don't try to cut no. a bagel. <laughs> Order them sliced. <laughs> well, I know uh, we are coming up on the 45 minute mark here. Uh, yes. um, so I would love to end uh, on a musical note, and I hope that everybody here is enjoying a little musical oasis with uh, us here at Artist Works. Um, if you're, if you want to get the free lessons, you're welcome to do that. Please go to artistworks.com forward slash free lessons. If you happen to be ready to jump right in, uh, for the folks that are watching here at home, uh, you can just use the promo code home 25 and get 25% off of any, uh, membership at ArtistWorks. But all of that aside, let's hear Jason Vio play us another beautiful tune. What, what would you like to play, Jason? We'll You've got so three minutes. I'm I got kidding. three minutes. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. I'll play, play something. I'll play something fa a little faster, right? I'll play okay, something good. up. And this is Danza Brasileira by Jorge Morel, another one that I hadn't played in about ten years until this summer. So good. to end a great uh, musical event. Thank you so much, Jason. Dave Bilger, thank you so much for joining us. Next time I want to hear some trumpet, so wake the Guaranteed. baby up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope both of you have a wonderful evening, and for all of you uh, who are joining us at home, I hope you have a wonderful musical evening as well, and uh, tomorrow night is going to be, well, tomorrow at 6 o'clock uh, Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific, we have the... Um, what we're referring to as the virtual electric guitar uh, roundtable with Paul Gilbert on rock guitar, Guthrie Trapp on country guitar, 
and uh, Keith Wyatt on blues guitar. It's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to be pretty loud. So I hope you'll join us back here. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Have a great Thanks, night, Patricia. everybody. Good. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Bye, Bye, Bye now.